So we've got uh, Jennifer joining us again, Raymond Chan, Michael, from whom we've just heard. Um, we have uh, David uh, Fairhurst, and we've also been joined by Brian Wisdom, who is the chief executive of People First, just in case um, there are any technical questions that uh, he might be in a position to answer for us. So between now and lunch at uh, one or five past one, we're going to have a panel discussion. I'm just going to ask Howard then to sum up for a couple of minutes at the end um, this morning's proceedings, the key points of this morning's proceedings. So that's where we are um, at this stage. Do we have microphones in there? We do. One, two. We've got some microphones. So we've got um, all of the ingredients that we need for... Um, a heated debate, or not, as the case may be. Um, if you don't mind sticking your hand up just so that we can get a microphone to you, that would be very useful. And also, uh, as you would know, it's useful in these circumstances if you don't mind just identifying yourself, what organisation you represent, because it, it helps all of us perhaps um, focus our comments um, to you directly. You can ask a general question or a specific question. I'm perfectly happy about that. So, uh, who would like to get us started? I mean, we've heard a lot. And we've covered an awful lot of ground already this morning, and I'm sure people would like to take the opportunity for 10 or 15 minutes just to maybe pick up on a few points for uh, clarification. Anybody like to dive in and get us started before I start to pick somebody? <laughs> I'm perfectly happy to do. I've spotted a few people I know. Better to be a volunteer. There we go. Okay. I can't see very well. Over Hello. Yeah. Uh, a quick one. Uh, McDonald's is here. Straight's here. And obviously, a big thing now with the sporting events that are coming to Northern Ireland, health is a big factor. What are you going to do about food and health in your uh, outlets? Right. Uh... Glenn, before, before you tell the world who you are, just for those who, who, who don't know, does everyone know Glenn? I like eating and I'm a strong man. <laughs> he's, he's... And healthy food is a big factor. And especially we're going to attract all these sporting people to Northern Ireland, your two outlets, maybe McDonald's especially, you know, what is health going forward for, to attract the, the uh, visitors and the kids that Northern Ireland is a place for health and a healthy eating. Okay, Glenn, thanks very much. Glenn Ross, in, in case uh, people don't know, but I'm sure people do know. Um, Michael, do you want a quick word on that first? Yeah. And, well, and then we'll hear from, uh, from my, uh, David. Yep. Yeah. Uh, can you pick me up there? You yeah, can. yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll just le lean forward slightly, maybe. Okay. How's yeah. that? There you go. Can you is hear that, okay? Is that yes. Size of me again. You don't have to lean further across the table than the big guys. Um, you, uh, Glenn, you're absolutely right. Health, health's very important. We've we had the, 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 the privilege over the last number of years um, of, of, of beating all of the strong men during the UK Championships when they when they come to Belfast. Um, and it is all healthy. It's an amazing the amount of healthy food that Glenn and his, his, his compatriots put away. It's, but it's amazing the amount of healthy food that they put away. You know, you're talking four or five large subs, um, you know, a thousand grams of pasta salads and tons of water uh, for a mid-morning break. Uh, no, it, it's incredible to do. But you're, you're right, and it's very, very important. But certainly in, 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 in the, from the street perspective point of view, we're actually just working great opportunity. We're working with the Food Standards Agency uh, at, at the moment um, to actually put the, the uh, calorie numbers, nutritional content uh, on all of the, the, the menus. It, it's law now in certain states in, in, in the United States to do this. So we're, we're doing that and we're piloting it uh, with three of the cafes in Northern Ireland, two in the South of Ireland and one in the Scotland uh, starting in March. Uh, we're, and uh, more and more, uh, we're also introducing the, the uh, sandwich without the bread. How Irish is that? But it certainly cuts back on costs. Uh, uh, but really, it's, it's a, it's a no-carb lunch. A no-carb lunch is, 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 is grow, grow, growing as well. So, yep, we're, 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 it's a bit like customer service. You've got to be at the forefront. More and more people are, are, are looking for, for a, a, a healthy visit or the healthy options. We always still love to say that you can come to the street for a treat um, because that's important as well, especially in... In, 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 in present time. So it's getting the mix right. Uh, health is very important to us. Um, and certainly because of the, our, our, our range of salads, sandwiches, uh, soups, yogurts, you can always get a, a, a very healthy treat at the street. What about David. Mickey D's? Yeah, Mickey D's. Um, <laughs> well, interesting question. Thank you for that as an opener. But uh, I think um, the, first, the first thing I would say is that you know, a, attracting people to any location relative to food is going to be down to the variety, choice, quality 
and actually not just the food and the transparency of what's in it, but actually the experience. So we know that where we've, uh, where we've uh, been successful is that you appeal to different audiences. So breakfast is a growing market for us. Uh, people like Wi-Fi, we talked about that earlier. Uh, decals feel different to how they used to do. Um, we've got some new things around children. So that's part of it, which is it is about choice. So it's about Northern Ireland having the variety and choice of a good quality to be known as a destination where that can happen. Um, it is also about experience. Um, you know, it, years back it was all about speed for us and, and it was quick and it was all the fast food thing. Now, people won't let go on the experience time, unfortunately. They still want it faster from us, but they expect a lot more. They expect smile, they expect um, a degree of comfort that, that wasn't there before and style and so on. So the experience is, um, re and, and, and linked to that, the training in, of our staff. Um, and then finally, I think there's a responsible position. People judge companies not just on, literally on the basics of their food, but how they behave generally. So, you know, again, it's about choice. If, if people don't eat with us every day, I shouldn't we re really just, you know, go into one type of food, any type of food, on a constant basis. But it is about choice. And if, if the nutritional labelling comes in that tells people what's in food, of which we're one of the volunteer companies, uh, throughout the UK that we're going to be one of the first to, to go as far as we are. As long as the information is there, as long as the choice, <laughs> but as long as we as a company act responsibly. So, you know, yes, we are involved in community. Yes, we are involved in sport. We are involved in the Olympics. We are involved in football coaches throughout the UK. So I think people will judge us on how, how we behave and not just what we say. And that's the modern transparent world that we, we live in. So I don't think it's just about the food. It's about the experience and it's about the behaviours and the way in which we behave. Okay, um, we've got somebody <coughs> just there in the middle. Yep, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Michael McLaughlin, uh, Walsh's Hotel. Um, I'd just like to ask the panel uh, how they would structure training in their organisation in terms of, uh, first of all, the staff that implement the, uh, the training, the content of the training, which uh, type of training they would prioritise in terms of time scale. And, for example, if they recognise a new requirement, how they would implement that. You know, for example, if your bus driver is now going to be uh, taking golfers, what you would do in relation to that or so forth. Okay, Great. thank you very much. Um, Jennifer, do you want to dive in on that one? Yeah, please. Um, hi, Michael. Um, I guess for, uh, for us, we've already scheduled uh, training. And if you attend some of the training sessions, the, sorry, the taster sessions, have, have uh, more chat about this as well. But we have looked at um, just putting days in the diary now. So we have a Monday and a Thursday that we're going to do the first part of the World Health Training. And that's principles of customer service. And that is a full day. And it really is a full nine to five day. And it covers a very, very broad range. So everything from what do your premises look like, or in our case, what do our vehicles look like whenever you first come in contact? How is the information getting out there to the customers? How do you make a first impression? How do you wow? How do you deal with complaints? Um, and then the next part of the training, which is a separate day, is called the Ambassadors Program. So for me, actually, this is the really, really unique thing about this program. So the Ambassadors Program gets people who are within their destinations to know more about within what's in their destination. So um, you actually... Um, get a bus, which is quite handy for some of us, and you, uh, you, know, you travel around your destination, you find out what hotels are available, what is their capacity, what, what do they have that we, we maybe don't know about. Um, a lot of us who are in small businesses in particular um, will all say the same thing. I mean, we just we don't have the time to go out and find out. We just know to the board, putting bums on seats, certainly that's what it is for us. Um, so the ambassador's end of it gives you a chance to actually find out more within our destinations. Can we really speak knowledgeably about the walls in, in Derry, London, Derry? And they are, are by far our most unique and spectacular feature. So it is, it does actually uh, address both of those things, is that everybody, everybody within our own business, and for us that means our coach drivers, as well as our customer service staff, in a way it means particularly our coach drivers, because they are in charge of making that first and last impression, but right across the organisation has a very good, comprehensive knowledge of what is expected what are our principles of customer service? And then the other half of it is ambassadors. So how it's done is really an internal um, uh, question. Like yourself, our operation goes seven days a week. 
So um, I sat with Pamela, my manager, and we said, okay, those two dates, we're going to do principles of customer service, and then we're going to put the two groups together and do the ambassador program. So, you know, it's all, <laughs> I was going to actually ask, you know, for us in, in small businesses, it's great, the theory is fantastic, but we really only care about how do we actually manage this, how do we schedule it, how do we pay for it. So sooner or later, you just have to choose a date, find out who's training in your area, choose a date that's available, and say to your staff, you five are going that day to do principal's customer service, you five are going that day to do principal's customer service, and then you're all together to do the ambassadors. Did that, uh, sorry, did that answer your question? Well, but let's just get a few different perspectives on it. Um, I mean, a yeah. brief thought, David? Yeah, just a brief note. Because <clears throat> you're talking about the method of training. I mean, some companies will be doing this, as you say, for... Uh, in more isolation, others will be building on, on what they've got. There's a role for e-learning in this, there's a role for shoulder to shoulder in this, there's a role for classroom in this. The one thing I would say is that it shouldn't operate in isolation of the rest of the culture, the way that we re reward and recognise people in the organisation. So if they do the training, they go back and the bosses don't endorse it and support it and people are recognised based on these values that you're trying to, then it won't live and sustain. So I think it needs to be looked at. In the, in the context of what else we're going to do in the business to make sure that when we open the Titanic, it isn't a one-off and a refresher. It actually lives in the way in which we talk and, and, and breathe yeah. in the organisation. Brian? Well, I, I, just to add to that, I think, is the, um, what we see in the um, sort of best organisations that make it live is that real ownership from managers in the business like Jennifer and Judith, who've actually said, I'm going to be a trainer. And as you've heard, actually, it isn't necessarily a given thing. You know, actually, it's a quality-assured um, process that you go through. And I know someone was asking about, is there training for managers um, over the coffee break? We'd like to start from the premise. There will be, but we'd like to start from the premise that wherever possible, the managers in the business actually become the trainers because that's the way those values live on and it becomes a regular thing. But we will be, we recognise some businesses have more managers, so we will be introducing over a period of time two things, actually, because um, we haven't talked about it today. But there's a small event going on over the pond uh, in 2012. Nothing like the scale of this, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the London Olympic Games are happening in the, in the summer. As part of that programme, we've been working with McDonald's to integrate uh, World Host into the training of the 70,000 volunteers. And actually, there is an e-learning program that actually will become available um, before the Olympic Games. And I promise you, we'll bring it to Northern Ireland first, um, where actually it will help the micro business access um, online training, which it's not as good as face to face, but it will be you know, a real asset, I think, to the um, Northern Ireland tourist proposition. We will also be bringing a manager's um, training program as well, which is under development at the moment, but I think you'll understand that uh, across there we are also actually uh, being specified by LOCOG, the London uh, Organising Committee of the Olympic Games, as the preferred supplier of customer service training to um, the service suppliers at the Olympic Games, so the people doing the catering, etc. <laughs> so we're, we have a, a big sort of demand on our time at the moment actually preparing uh, for that. But this really is, you know, just to put it in perspective for you, a truly world-class programme that you're adopting over here. And I, I sort of commend you, actually, for your, your enlightenment in grabbing this right at the, the start. I think it's very exciting for the events you've got coming up. And just a comment on the food, uh, Glenn. If the diet in Northern Ireland produces golfers like you've got over here, <laughs> I'm coming over. I tell you, that's a much easier way for me to improve my handicap than mucking around on a training ground. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a bit more than the food. But, uh, <laughs> uh, Raymond, do you, do you want to contribute any thoughts on, on, on your experience of, of how it can work and... and yeah, I, maybe I, what we need to look out for as well, potential pitfalls. Well, I, I'm just impressed. Um, there's a lot of rivalry, um, I, I sense, in the room uh, in terms of, like, uh, what you're going to do. I think um, that's extremely... No. No, no Brian just, thinks there's a lot of rivalry. There uh, isn't a lot of rivalry. Friendly competition <laughs> to, uh, to, to sort of continue to refresh you on the top of the escalator, as uh, Michael was saying. And, and I think that's, um, I think as you, you adopt this program, and I know it's going to be hugely successful because you've already got the partnerships, you've got the support of government, you've got the support of um, great organizations. Um, over, 
over 25 years, what I've observed is that um, back where it was originated, this program, uh, you're going to experience um, times where you know how do how do you sort of keep keep it alive? You know, it's uh, I take it for granted. It's been part of our customer service culture, and it's taken 25 years. If I remember uh, when I was growing up, it's not that old, but when it was introduced during the uh, 86 acquisition, we had 75,000 people through that program. It was developed two years in advance. And I, I'm trying to remember saying, well, where's Northern Ireland today? And uh, you know, where were we back then? We had nervousness. We'd never, tourism was really an upstart industry back in 86 in, in, in Canada and, and certainly. But after that, we saw <laughs> phenomenal exponential growth over on the next several decades. And so some of the things that, that you're gonna develop on your own is how do you keep keep the program alive? How do you make it relevant to the small businesses so that um, they can take the, the training and bring it right back, not like a week's time, but how can you start to integrate your own uh, business right away? And so what we've seen is we actually, back in Canada, have 10 modules, and we've seen the one-day program still fundamentally important to introduce. But we've also introduced, like uh, just-in-time training, two, three-hour uh, <coughs> workshops uh, suited to our customer base, like our, our travel uh, customers are a little different than, than perhaps where you are right now, but we've had to evolve. We've also seen champions in local communities. I, I didn't get a chance to talk, but we have 120 delivery organizations. Each of them have um, had their own uh, friendly rivalry. So Northern British Columbia, which is a la large land mass, but very sparse in population, they want to be the first tourism region of six to have um, all their uh, high percentage of all their businesses through. We have an airport. We have several airports, uh, many airports in BC. They want to be the first certified <coughs> world host airport by having 70% of all their employees through. We've got a, a retail shopping center uh, wanting to say, we want to have uh, a designated um, logo that we are a certified world-class uh, <coughs> customer service. So that's how we've, we've uh, tried to do, do is keep the product alive. <coughs> um, innovation will come from your champions all throughout Northern Ireland. Thank you very much. Um, just mindful of the time, I don't want us to um, cause problems for the, the, the uh, folks who are providing lunch, but I think we can squeeze another one in if people want to ask another quick question. Um, is there somebody? Sorry, just over here. Yeah. Hello, my name is Claire Gibson. I'm a world host trainer, and I have the privilege and the pleasure of living in the North Coast. One of the words we heard um, mentioned this morning quite a few times was transport. And I think it was fantastic to hear what Jennifer had to say and what she's doing with Air Porter. Tr uh, tourism on the North Coast is already an all year round um, activity. Our infrastructure in terms of transport is sadly lacking. And I have taken public transport myself or tried to in a number of times and you can get on a bus from Ballycastle to Ballymena once or twice a day. It's a 52-seater, I think, 50-something anyway. And there's usually between two and four people on it, and that's including the driver. Now, I just, it's a plea I think I'm making as much as anything else in a request. And Jennifer, perhaps <coughs> another little business idea for you. But we need an infrastructure of transport in the North Coast if we are going to meet our visitors' needs, if we are going to supply that service that we so very much want to. Mm. And I really think somebody should think about that and about the question of why are we using big, expensive buses that are, must be very hard in fuel and are certainly doing the environment no good when there must be a much better way of doing it. But it's got to be linked up. It's really very difficult, especially in the off-season, to get from Ballycastle to Coleraine or Port Rush or Port Stewart or Bush Mills. Now, with the fantastic event of the Irish Open, I'm absolutely thrilled about it. But I think it's an all-year thing, and I think it's something that seriously requires looking at. It's not the first time um, uh, at an event like this that it's been raised. Jennifer, do you want to say just a quick quick word about that? You know what, we'll maybe get a chat at lunch because um, I, I'd be here all day. That's the life. Yeah. We, we will get a chat at But lunch. it's an issue, that's the point. You, you it, it definitely is an issue. I, I wouldn't know, to be honest, and if somebody wants to jump in in the room, how do we sort of form a bit of a, a working group about it? Um, well, just a, a, a quick, a quick. Well, very quickly, you know, folks in the room might might be aware that very recently people first are, are, are merging with Go Skills, um, which 
you know, is the is the the uh, skills council that looks after the very services that you're that you're talking about, Claire. And he's going to love me for this. Mal's in the room. Mal McGravy's probably in the room. Who is the the the, the chair of the the uh, forum for for gold skills? So you know, I'm not going to put Mal on the spot. Be be wrong with me. And um, we had a wonderful conversation last night about the fantastic plans for transport in Northern Ireland over the over the, over the next number of years. But Mal is now working very closely with us. It, so therefore, it's much more joined up in terms of of of, of tourism and transport and working together. So there's an opportunity to, to get that back through to, to Mal. Right. Unless you want to say something, Mal. Yeah. Oh. We're not saying it's your fault, Mal. But <laughs> we, we, we'd like you to sort it out for us, if you could, please. Well, I think we, we've been working on it really for quite some time now. Um, TransLink offers a mass transit public transport service, and that's what we're good at. We're developing a world-class railway system, albeit small. It is. It was winner of the UK uh, Rail Business Award a couple of years ago. We're going to have the youngest fleet of trains in the British Isles by the end of this year. We have still some work to do on the railway side. On the bus side, it still is a mass transit system, and I think what we need is better integration, better integration with the smaller private sector, better integration with taxis. That's going to happen through the current public transport reform processes, but it does just take a little bit more time and a bit more investment. Okay, right. Well, anyway, you're elected to have a little conversation around your table. You, Claire would like to join you, Jennifer would like to join you, Michael would like to join you, and that's our contribution to tourism today. Thank you very much. I, I think probably it would be wise to just park it at this stage so that we don't run too much over the time, but I know that our uh, panellists are sticking around uh, for lunch, so if you want to speak to them on an individual basis, uh, they'd be more than happy to have a conversation with you. Can I just take this opportunity on your behalf of thanking Judith, who's left us, but um, David and Brian and Michael and Raymond and Jennifer for their thought-provoking contributions. Thank you all very much indeed. Um, and can I just... <laughs>